Testing, one, two, testing, one, two. There we go. Glad to have you guys with us on this Tuesday night Bible study. Sorry for the little snafu there, um, but we are good to, good to go right now and glad to have you. Hope that you are receiving the signal well. Hope that you can hear me and see me um, as vividly as we um, are desiring this live stream program to work. If not, you can email us directly at Hayward gmail.com gbc hayward at gmail.com for those of you who have been with us for a while you know that we have been working through the book of the revelation of jesus christ and we are basically doing overviews of the book looking at it from certain angles with the purpose of getting a framework of the overall theme of the book of the revelation in order to kind of put the big puzzle pieces together, our big building blocks together, and then as we make our way through the book in a fairly consistent fashion, probably beginning this Sunday um, for the next several weeks and months, we'll have an idea of some of the terminology, some of the symbolism and typology, some of the pictures and concepts that the book of Revelation assumes you will know in order for you to have a flow of freedom and consistency from chapter 1 to chapter 22. Tonight we are looking at Revelation chapter 7. In fact, tonight's study is called The Sealed Are the Saved. The Sealed Are the Saved, subtitle The Israel of God. The Sealed Are the Saved. In a real sense, you kind of already know what we're dealing with because in the past we talked about that you know as we dealt with the seven seals in revelation chapter six and then revelation chapter eight and then we dealt with the seven trumpets in revelation chapters eight and nine and then we began to look at the bowl judgments the seven bowl judgments in Revelation 15 and 16. So you already have been somewhat uh, uh, made acquainted with the concept of the seal. And I wanted to press into it in chapter seven because what chapter seven does for us, it gives us a nice little break, a kind of reprieve from the total calamity of the lamb that is poured out, the wrath of the lamb that's poured out upon the world in Revelation chapter six. The last few verses in Revelation chapter 6, before we get to Revelation chapter 7, that whole uh, uh, chapter 5 through 7 becomes a high energy, high intensity set of visions and, uh, and, and uh, concepts and images around the Lamb having opened up the seven seals and the seven seals unfurling as we know in a progressive development of the one scroll we see at the end of chapter 6 this language that we have described in verse uh, 14 through 17 these words and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Now we have a picture of what? Judgment day occurring where the end of time is represented by the scroll rolling up. The scroll unfolds to give us the development of human history and then it's rolled together, if you will, in order to close up or to sum up and bring us to that very vivid imagery of notice the language that's used here in verse 15 of every bondman, every freeman hiding themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and saying to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? That particular dramatic event now it's interrupted by chapter eight. It's a break. It's a kind of, we would call it a, a kind of parenthetical 
only because what our Lord Jesus Christ is about to do now while you and I are in suspense about the wrath of the Lamb coming down upon humanity, we are now looking at his view of what he does for his people on the earth. And the people that are on the earth now are particular people of which, I need somebody to go deal with the door, uh, particular people of which you and I want to now know what these people are about and how these people play a part in our life. And so this is why it says in verse 1, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. Until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. This is kind of where I want you and I to begin to stop and begin to think and to work through the uh, immense distinction between chapter 6 and this dramatic event occurring in verses 14 through 17 where we see wrath coming down from heaven, the wrath of the Lamb coming down upon humanity from heaven. And yet in chapter 7, after this, John says, I saw the four angels, if you will, standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth nor on the sea or on any tree. So now you have a totally different set of visions, kind of a totally different uh, set of images that you and I want to work through. Uh, a scenario that's quite unique, quite important, quite symbolic, but different than what we had in chapter 6. Why? Because what the Lord wants you and I to understand is there are events that are taking place in heaven that are coming down from heaven upon the earth. It's called the wrath of the Lamb. But there are also events coming down on the earth. And if you will, it's not quite like this, but this is a great way to view it. While the wrath of the Lamb is about to be poured out upon humanity because of his rebellion and disobedience, and more particularly, as you learned before, because of the prayers of the saints in Revelation chapter 6, 10, how long, O oh Lord, do you not judge us against those who have persecuted us? And then Christ responds immediately by this sixth seal as we're looking at. And you guys also know now that the seventh seal corresponds with the first trumpet judgment. So I want to show you something that's fairly uh, important and neat about the book of Revelation that'll help you with that. If you look up on my board, I have here a section of, of threes. I have one section here that actually starts from chapter one through seven. Then I have here another section where chapters 8 go all the way to chapter 14. And then I also have from chapter 14 all the way to chapter 21. Now, why 21 when there are 22 books in the book of Revelation? Well, because there's a kind of a, a numbers game going on. I don't like to use the term, uh, term game, but there's kind of a numbers dynamic in the book of Revelation that you actually have to know in order to be able to understand what God is up to. In fact, on Friday, that's what we're going to do. On Friday, we're going to deal with the numbers of the Bible from number one all the way to, let's say, uh, numerically, number 14 from 1 to 14, but within that, we're going to be dealing with larger numbers by the multiplication of the number 10 moving to a number 1,000 and the number uh, 12 moving to 144,000 as we're dealing with here. And so we will be dealing with the numbers of the Bible because in the book of Revelation, here's what you have to know, is that the book of Revelation is coded not only with imagery and typology and symbolism that we have to be acquainted with, but it's also coded with numbers. So what I say is that chapter 1 through 7 gives us that first set of Christ's rule, his session in the church and his session at the throne. And when we get to chapter 7, you notice how chapter 7 opens up and it begins to deal with numbers. You see the number here that we're going to deal with tonight. It's the number of the sealed. 
Notice what that number is over in verse 4 of chapter 7. And I heard the number of them that were sealed. Here's what it says. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Do you see that? Now that's in chapter 7, verse 4. Now watch this. If you go from chapter 7 to chapter 14. Notice what it says in chapter 14, verse 1. Chapter 14, verse 1 gives us some very similar language as we have in chapter 7, verse 4. In chapter 14, verse 1, it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him, wouldn't you know, 144,000 having his father's name written in their forehead. Do you see the similarity? 144,000 in chapter 7, 144,000 in chapter 14. But wait, let's go to chapter 21 because in chapter 21, it makes mention of it again. In Revelation chapter 21, let's look at verse 15 and 16 and notice the similarity of the number code. And there is a definite relationship that I want you to understand with it because otherwise you won't fully appreciate chapter 7 and the whole idea of being sealed. It says over in verse 15, these words. And he, that is the angel, talked with me, had a golden reed to measure. Remember, we've been talking about the reed and the measuring line, have we not? And how blessed we are if God gives us a measure. Because that means that you and I are a partaker of the kingdom of God. And what are we measuring, saints? The temple of the living God. Paul called it the love of God in Christ in Ephesians 3.18. Remember, broad and long and deep and wide and high. The breadth, the length, the width and the heights of the love of God in Christ. He's describing God's temple. And notice here uniquely the language that's used in verse 15 and 16. And he had talked with me, he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates therein and the wall thereof. Now notice what he says in verse 16. And the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed. Now watch this, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. That means it's 12 times 12. 12 times 12 is what? 144. Now notice what it says over in verse 17. And he measured the wall thereof. And incidentally, the term is used here too. 144 cubit according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. So in Revelation 7, you have 144,000 and then you have 12 tribes. In Revelation chapter 14, you have 144,000 of what is called the servants of God who are not only sealed, but sealed in their forehead. And then in Revelation chapter 21, guess what we are measuring? The temple of the living God. So let me say this to you at the outset and up front so that you may know what's going on. And in my understanding of the book of Revelation, we are dealing with a grand set of images that has to do with Christ and the church. So as we work our way through Revelation chapter 7, I want you to realize that the way I understand Revelation chapter 7 is this wonderful word of comfort given to Christ's sheep coming out of this tribulation where they are persecuted and put to death according to Revelation 6, 10, the souls that are under the altar. They have been put to death. We saw that on Sunday with the world hating the gospel and wanting to persecute the gospel. And then what? Killing the two witnesses. This is all part of identifying with Jesus, is it not? But here in Revelation 7, you and I have a great word of comfort that you and I want to benefit from. Before the unmitigated wrath of God falls upon humanity, represented by, remember, if we're in chapter 7, what comes in chapters 8 and 9? The trumpet judgments. Before those trumpet judgments are dealt with in our conscience and in our heart, you know what God does? He shows us the number of those who are sealed and protected from a wrath coming down that's going to destroy the world. This is a word of comfort and encouragement and edification to the people of God. I asked you guys this last week. Are you sealed? Today I'm giving you the definition. The sealed are the saved. 
The sealed are the saved. The sealed are the Israel of God. Now, what I want to be able to do today and then tomorrow, we're going to come back and look at the larger portion of Revelation chapter seven, dealing with all 14 verses. We're going to deal with just the first three or four or five verses in front of us leading up to the ceiling. And next week, we'll come back and deal with verse five all the way through verse 14 and talk about or tomorrow rather and talk about why God uses the term the 12 tribes of Israel and show you how that language completely comports with the New Testament church. And again, on Friday, what we're going to be dealing with are the numbers, because once you get an understanding of the use of numbers in the book of Revelation, you will automatically have an alarm going off in your head. The number seven. What do you think is the most significant number in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ? It's the number seven. The number seven will be utilized by Jesus in the imagery that carries itself throughout the whole book of the revelation in such a way as to make us comprehend that what we are reading is a completed revelation. Number seven, the number seven represents what? Completion and perfection. So you see seven running all the way through the book. In fact, that's why I say what we have here is chapters one through seven. And then seven more chapters going to chapter 14 and then seven more going to chapter 21 and chapter 22 closes out the book of Revelation in that grand eschatological imagery of the paradisio state. Remember what we learned about that, how that Revelation 22 one opens up and I saw a throne and the lamb that was on the throne and the river of water of life proceeding from the throne. And, and that's grand imagery going back to the Genesis narrative, dealing with the four rivers flowing out of the garden of Eden to water the whole world. And that vision in Revelation 22 verse one, is the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Father on the throne and the Lamb on the throne as the Son, and the Spirit of the living God as the water flowing from the throne. And remember what Jesus, what John says, I saw trees on either side of the river of life, and the trees were for the healing of the nation. When we get to that last chapter in the book of Revelation, we have been returned to and advanced into that perfect state of fellowship with God because of the work of Christ on the cross. But now what we're dealing with in Revelation <clears throat> chapter seven is some very interesting, necessary and edifying language. Like I said, the sealed are the saved. They are the Israel of God. Now, I want you to hear what I'm saying now. The seal are the saved. They are the Israel of God. And it's important for you to know this. The sealed are secure and they are safe. They also are serving and they are sanctified. They are successful. The sealed are the saints of the living God. And if you notice, chapter seven is quite different than chapter six. In chapter six, the people are panicking. They're fear stricken. In chapter seven... The servants are standing there at peace. There's a radical distinction between what you see in chapter <clears throat> six and in chapter seven. In chapter seven, it's quite uh, tranquil. In fact, the latter part of chapter seven, you've seen this already, as it says over in verse 17. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto the living, unto living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That's the way it closes. So chapter seven is a beautiful picture that is indicative of what it means to be sealed. But we want to make our way all the way to that ceiling today by dealing what, with what's in front of us. So on the one hand, the sealed are the secure. They are the safe. They are the serving ones because the language tells us they're servants. They are the serving ones. They are successful saints. They are not in a panic mode, but they are real, actually in military readiness. Military readiness is what you see over in chapter 14, verse 1. Let me show it to you again. Revelation 14, verse 1. And I submit to you that in Revelation 14, verse 1, we're dealing with the same people in Revelation chapter 7. Notice what it says. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having their father's name in their forehead. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Now watch it. 
And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the beast and before the elders. And no one could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So watch this. These who have the seal in their fathers, in their forehead of their father's name are also the ones that are redeemed from the earth. Notice what it says in verse 4. These are they which are not defiled with women. In other words, they're called virgins. Now notice what else it says. For they are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goes. Now, if you go back to Revelation chapter 7, that's what it says in verse 15 and 16. They follow the lamb whithersoever he goes. So I'm here to tell you what you have in chapter 7 and what you have in chapter 14 are two sides of the same coin. The subject matter is the same. The sealing of those who are the servants of God. In chapter 7, they are described in a tranquil state. In chapter 14, they are described in a triumphant state with the lamb. The language there is graphic and we'll pick it up tomorrow. But I do want you to see the correlation between chapter 7 and chapter 14. It is not a coincidence and neither is chapter 21. So what we've got going on here, I would uh, lay out very clearly, is that <clears throat> what is taking place in chapter 7 is a word of comfort and edification to the people of God that no one for whom Christ died will ever come under eternal judgment or eternal condemnation or eternal destruction, no matter how bad things begin to occur as we move toward the end of time. These little snippets will be... <clears throat> Uh, occurring two or three times in the book, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Revelation. So you want to be careful to see them when they occur. But something interesting occurs in verse one. And now we want to pick up the drama because we want to understand what we are sealed from. Quite frankly, there are about seven questions we really can raise. And I think I'll touch on them tomorrow. We've already answered one. Who are the sealed? But the other question we want to ask is, what is the seal? And we began to answer that two weeks ago when we said to be sealed is to be authenticated. To be sealed is to be affirmed. To be sealed is to be owned and protected and preserved and kept. Didn't we say that? So whenever you have a seal on something, whenever an owner purchases something, he uses his own signet to seal it. And that thing then is owned by him. It's authenticated by him. It's affirmed by him. It's secured by him. It's preserved by him. It's kept by him. And listen, all of God's people are owned by God. They are affirmed by God. They are authenticated by God. They are preserved by God. They are protected by God. They are kept by God. Do you see that? This is why I asked the question, are you sealed? And that's what's going on there. Here are some other questions we might ask around the seal. Not only um, <clears throat> who are the seal and what is the seal, who does the sealing? Who does the sealing? That's something we want to more fully develop as well tomorrow. Who does the sealing? If you look in our text, notice what it says over in verse, uh, verse 3 of chapter 4. The uh, John the servant says over here in verse 3, and uh, rather verse two, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Will you notice in verse two in this context, an angel has the seal. An angel has the seal. Well, we're going to get into that here in a moment. But didn't we learn on Sunday that angels play a major role in the book of Revelation because they are what? They are ministering spirits sent to minister on the behalf of those who are heirs of what? Salvation. So we are quite comfortable <clears throat> by now, are we not? With angels being part of the revelatory function of God's glory in Christ for the saints. We, we better be ready to look for angels all the way through the revelation. So we are asking who is the one doing the sealing? The instrumental means here is the angel. But we have a whole lot more to, to ask in that in that light because we will see tomorrow that the sealing covers a whole bunch of things. But here is another question that brings us to our next point. From what are they sealed? 
From what are they sealed? Why does God have to seal anything that he owns? Why does God have to seal anyone that he owns? Well, he seals it not only to authenticate it. He seals it not only to affirm it as he is. He seals it to protect it. So when you seal something, you are sealing it from something as, a, as well as sealing it to something. God is sealing his people to himself. <clears throat> we know that Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. But he's also sealing his people from something. And the text lays out what it is that he seals us from. Now, this is going to take up the bulk of our time today. Because God wants us to know from what we are sealed. I'm so glad to know I'm sealed. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse 20 and 21 lets us know that Ephesians chapter um, uh, Ephesians chapter um, one, verse 13 and 14 lets us know that. But I also want to know from what am I being sealed? And in this context, we are told in verse one, we are being sealed from the four winds, the four winds. Look at it. Verse one. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not hurt or blow on the earth, nor on the sea or any tree. So you got this suspense going on. And this suspense is the suspense of dramatic events about to take place, but are being held back. Here's the word. It comes under point number one, restrained. So on the one hand, you and I are being sealed and therefore, in that sealing process, God is restraining in order that everyone who is to be sealed will be sealed. Point number one, then, in your outline. Point number one. This lays it out for us. A redemptive restraint observed. A redemptive restraint observed. John says, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds. And now let's ask a question. Is this the first time we've ever seen this language? Or is this language also something that we can quickly reference in the Old Testament, somewhere back in the other prophets? If you've been tracking with me, you know that John has become for us a new Daniel, a new Ezekiel, and a new Zechariah. What that means is when you hear about the four winds in the book of Revelation, and this is not the only time you're going to hear about it, it's immediately asking you to go backwards to the book of Daniel. Notice what it says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, 2, and 3 in the book of Daniel chapter 7, because Daniel now is being employed by Jesus in the life of John in order to teach us something about the ceiling. Now, you've heard this before, and it's an opportunity right now for us to explain exactly what's going on here in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. This language is almost exactly the same language that we have in Revelation chapter 7 as well. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and a vision uh, of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matter. Now watch this. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold, here it is, the four winds of the heavens striving upon the great sea. Do you see it? The four winds of the heavens striving upon the great sea. The Lord Jesus wants you and I to know that John is being now occupied in Revelation chapter 7 with an understanding of the four winds as they are referred to in Daniel chapter 7. Now watch what it says in Daniel 7 about these four winds that in Revelation 7 are being held back. Here's what it says in verse four, verse three. And the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked up as it were lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon his feet as a man. Verse five. And behold, another beast, a second like unto a bear, and it raised itself up on its side. It had three ribs in his mouth. And between the teeth thereof, and they said unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. And after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. So it was a flying leopard. 
The beast had also four heads and dominion was given it. And this I saw in the night visions and behold, a fourth beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly and had great iron teeth and it devoured in broken pieces and stamped the residue with the feet thereof. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. So stop right there. Do you notice what's happening? We are reading about Daniel's vision and it's starting to correspond with John's vision in terms of the winds striving. The winds are being held back in Revelation chapter 7. In Daniel's book, they're blowing upon the great sea. Why? Because the winds serve as a power force to blow upon the seas, to move the waters of the seas so that the waters now become tumultuous and wrathful and impactful because that imagery is to teach us something about the relationship between the wind and the sea is to teach us something about how the nations of the world begin to move and act in their attempt to control and dominate and exercise power and dominion and to destroy the whole of the earth. And this is why Daniel depicts them as what? Beasts, as beasts. The winds are blowing in Daniel 7. In Revelation 7, they're being what? Held back. The winds are blowing in Daniel 7, and Daniel 7, all the way through Daniel 12, will explain to us that we're dealing with what? The Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Grecian kingdom, and the Roman Empire, and then the Roman Empire all the way to the end of time, which is where you and I are. The blowing of the winds upon the seas then becomes this great metaphor, watch this now, of chaos moving countries and kings and kingdoms and powers to act in wrathful hostility towards one another. It is the imagery of Jesus Christ which says kingdom will be against kingdom and nation against nation and every man will be against his neighbor. That's the imagery and you know it yourself very well. There's a very clear hint here of Matthew 24 and, and Mark 13 and, and Luke 17 and 19 here. The imagery is of the waves uh, roaring and, and tumultuously impacting the world. It's called chaos in the, the larger cosmic imagery. Now, how do we understand the imagery of the, the winds and the waves? Well, the Bible tells us very clearly what we are dealing with. And I want to kind of lay out a set of principles for you. But know this, the winds and the waves that we're seeing in Daniel 7, are restrained in Revelation chapter 7 while God is doing what? Sealing his people. The winds in Daniel 7 are going forth. The winds in, in Revelation 7 are restrained. What are these winds? And what are these seas? They are political and religious forces. They are powers and institutions and kingdoms. In fact, this is how Daniel has it interpreted to him over in Daniel chapter 7, verse 18, uh, verse 19, Daniel 7, 19. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the other beasts. Daniel was struggling with what he heard. In fact, look at it in verse 17. It says in verse 17, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise up out of the earth. And then they begin to explain to Daniel who they are. What are they? They are kingdoms. They are uh, powers. They are authorities. They are institutions. They are also devils. They're also demonically controlled. The winds blow upon the seas and they produce what we would call a cosmic conflict, a social and political or even spiritual event and set of movements that are designed to control and dominate people groups creating violence and conquest. That's the way the whole world has operated from the beginning of time. Whether we're talking about the ancient monarchs in the Middle East, in the days of Moses with Egypt, or even further on down the line when Israel became a monarchy a thousand years before Jesus. Remember the, the kings that were in opposition to them, the Assyrian kingdom, the Egyptian kingdom, and then ultimately the Babylonian kingdom and the Medo-Persian kingdom. And then the Grecian kingdom with Alexander the Great, which made a major contribution of bringing Hellenistic Greek philosophy and culture to the world by which the gospel spread. And then ultimately the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire. 
And so um, what we are looking at here in this account, Will, I'll need you to check and see who it is that's out there, okay, because I don't know who that is. Um, what we're looking at <clears throat> is uh, the blowing of the winds representing the nations of the world coming up out of the sea. Now, that theme also is clearly laid out in the Bible. I'll use a couple verses to remind you. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 22. Notice what it says. Isaiah 57, 22. Isaiah 57, 22 says, but the wicked are like the troubled sea. Isaiah chapter 57, 22, if we can get there. Isaiah chapter 57, 22 lays this out. The wicked are as the troubled sea that's tossed to and fro that cannot rest. Here it is. I'm over at verse 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Do you see it? There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And then we see the same language given in the book of Revelation, if you will. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Because Revelation chapter 7 is restraining the winds. But in Revelation 13, 1, notice what John says. And I stood upon the sands of the sea, the sea there, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. John is now seeing the same thing that Daniel saw in Daniel's day, some 500 years before Jesus. John is now seeing the same thing, beast rising up out of the sea. Now notice what John says. A beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now stop right there. We won't get into that until we get a little bit further down the road, but what you are looking at in Revelation 13 is the fourth beast that Daniel was questioning back in Daniel chapter 7 verse 19. Who is this fourth beast? Now with that particular symbolism and typology and now this imagery, this zoomorphism of a monstrosity of a hybrid of an animal in chapter 13 of Revelation that's being mentioned back in Daniel chapter 7. We have a progression of history, do we not? A progression of history from the Gentile rulers of the Babylonians, Medo-Persians, the Grecians, and the Roman Empire. So what we kind of have Ladies and gentlemen, this is a kind of chronology of the present rule of the Roman Empire in Daniel chapter or Revelation chapter 13, if you will. In Daniel's day, he was under Nebuchadnezzar and then he was under Darius as the Medo-Persian king and then he died off. He didn't see the Grecian kingdom. He certainly didn't see the Roman Empire in the which our Lord Jesus Christ was in. But none of those kingdoms are really the issue for you and I, with the exception of this. What the Bible lays out about kingdoms is that kingdom are, kingdoms are societies of beasts that are hostile, predatorial, and violent. That you do not get the picture of uh, kingdoms being docile servants like the ox, which is a type of Jesus Christ, or being um, kind and gentle and productive uh, working together, if you will, in a kind of collaboration for the prosperity of the world. No, you don't see that with the kings of the Bible or the kingdoms of the Bible. You see hostile, very aggressive, very uh, bloodthirsty, very predatorial kings, predatorial beasts, if you will. And what is God doing? He's holding those beasts back in Revelation chapter 7 for the sealing of his people. So we see this imagery of restraint. And I want to deal with that principle for a moment because this imagery of restraint simply means this. <clears throat> God is sovereign over those beasts. He's sovereign over those kingdoms. He's sovereign over those nations. He's sovereign over the devil that's behind them. Let me see if I can help you. If you have the picture, the seas according to Revelation chapter 17 and according to Isaiah 57, 20 and 21 are peoples and nations and kindreds and tongues. But the wicked are like the troubled sea that have no rest day or night. That's true of our world. I was true of you and I before we were saved. We were like the people that are tossed to and fro. But God was in control of us too. He's in control of all things, is he not? He's in control of the winds that blow upon the seas. He's in control of the seas 
that become topsy-turvy and emerge into these major power institutions called governments. He's in control of the government. But he's also con in control of this great beast behind all the beastly kingdoms by which those beastly kingdoms do his bidding. Do you know who that beast is? That beast is Satan. God is in control of him too. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 27 verse 1. See now notice what we're doing. We're taking the whole of the Bible and defining the terms biblically so that we can understand that the book of Revelation is a proto eschatological book taking old things and new things and progressing redemptive history to bring us to Jesus, right? So you cannot really sufficiently interpret the book of the Revelation anywhere in that book in an isolated fashion. Now notice what Isaiah 27, 1 says. Isaiah 27, 1 says, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish who? Leviathan. Now notice how Leviathan is described. Leviathan, the piercing what? Serpent. Who is the serpent? Satan. Notice what it says. Even Leviathan, the crooked serpent. There it is, two time. And he shall slay the dragon that is in the what? Seas. Oh. So now we have winds blowing upon the sea. We have the seas rising up. Then we have nations emerging up out of the sea, both in Daniel as well as in the book of Revelation chapter 13. And what is that composite explaining to us? How that Satan works in a maniacal way to control the kings of the earth and raises them up to be these conflicting entities at war with each other as they head toward the end of time. And ultimately they work together with one objective to oppose the true and the living God and his kingdom. I'll put this out here to you as we begin to look more uh, intently at the concept of restraint. When we carefully look at Daniel chapter 4, I'm sorry, Daniel 7, we are dealing with more than four kingdoms. In Daniel chapter 7, we see the four beasts. But also in Daniel 7, we see a fifth kingdom. Do you know what that kingdom is? It's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of Christ. It's the kingdom that Daniel describes back in chapter 2 as the stone cut out without hands. That stone crushing all the kingdoms of men. That's the kingdom that is behind what we are seeing in the book of Revelation from chapters 1 through 22. And so it's important for you to know, even though we are focusing right now on the restraining of those kingdoms, there's another kingdom operating in that kingdom, according to Daniel chapter two and Daniel chapter seven. And the people of that kingdom will take the world, will dominate the foes and actually exist with God for all eternity. Go back to point number one. Let's begin to make some application around why God seals his servants. He seals his servants as part of a restraint process. So point A. I call the method of sealing or the mode of sealing, the sort of uh, reason for which God restrains. He restrains in order to save his people before he unleashes his judgments on the world. I'll give you an example. In sub point A, it says the preaching of the gospel is God's mode of restraint. Do you remember what happened in the days of Noah? We read in the book of, no, uh, book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 3, where God saw the wickedness and the evil of mankind. The imagination of his heart was only evil continually. Remember that? And then God said in Genesis, chapter 6, that he would destroy the earth. He would destroy the earth and that he was only going to give mankind 120 years. He would not always strive with flesh. In other words, God is preparing judgment upon that world. He was going to wipe out all creation. And he did, did he not? But before he wiped them out, what did he do? He implemented a salvation plan in Noah. By giving Noah 100 years to do what? Build an ark. What did God do with that wicked world that he wanted to destroy in those days? He restrained them from doing evil so long, doing what we would call ultimately destructive evil, so long as the ark was in building. 
Now, what is the ark? It is a type of the preaching of the gospel. How do we know that? Peter told us that Noah was a righteous man preaching the kingdom of God by the building of the ark as we see it in Genesis chapter 6. So what you have is a narrative in Genesis 6 saying, yes, they are wicked. Yes, they are marauders. Yes, they are great renowned men. Yes, they are operating out of demonic powers. But God is also restraining them from a massive experience of not their judgment, but God's judgment. He's restraining them. He's restraining them until at last he said it back in the book of Daniel chapter 7 when he told Daniel in Daniel chapter 7 to come into the ark. And the day that Daniel, not Daniel, but Noah entered into the ark, what happened? The waters began to pour down upon the whole human race. So you have this motif of God looking upon the wickedness of men. God saying, I'm going to destroy all flesh. But before he destroys it, what does he do? He gives a hundred year probation for Noah to build an ark, which represents the preaching of the gospel, where he restrains their evil until God's plan is accomplished. And then God brings his family into the ark. It's a type of sealing because when Noah and his family are in the ark, the waters of God's judgment come down, just like Revelation chapter 6. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of His wrath has come. But they have no hiding place. They're not sealed. They're not covered. They're not protected. Noah was. Noah's children were. And that was a great picture of the end of the world, because they had to start all over. Noah became the second Adam, did he not? So we have a picture of how the reason for which God seals you and me is so that we do not come into the wrath that he plans on pouring out upon the wicked in this world. Let me give you another example. Remember the days of Lot, Genesis chapter 19, where God had come in that sort of uh, uh, what we call theophany of God in three persons to Abraham in chapter 18 and said he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. The wrath of God is hanging over Sodom and Gomorrah, is it not? But before he does it, what does he do? He goes to Lot and the two angels and the two angels enter into the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot finds them right away. And he does what? Seeks to pull them into his house. That's Genesis chapter 19, verse one and two. And they say, no, we're going to stay out in the streets, verse three and four. But Lot says, I pray you don't stay out in the street. Why? Because Lot knows these are wicked men. What Lot does not know is that the wrath of the Lamb of God is hanging over their head, about to be poured out upon them. And if God did not come and give Lot the warning, so that Lot now turns to his family and begins to preach the good news. What do you mean good news, pastor? It's good news when you are told that the only way of escape is submitting to God's deliverance plan right now. It's good news when your family did not know just yesterday that the wrath of God was hanging on the head of the whole city of which you have been a part of and identified with all your life. It's good news when God says, flee the wrath to come right now. That's good news. They didn't listen, did they? Neither did his wife, but didn't Lot listen? Well, he almost didn't listen. What did the angels have to do? They had to carry him by the hand along with his two daughters and pull them out, pull them out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the moment that they made it out, he allowed them, the angels allowed Lot in his rebellion and his sinfulness, but he was saved according to Peter. He was a righteous man, but he was definitely carnal. He allowed Lot and his two daughters to stay in a little city down the road. And at the moment that they had gotten delivered out of Sodom and Gomorrah, what did God do? He poured his wrath upon Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed it. This would be the same kind of picture that you would get with the children of Israel when it came time for Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. Do you remember what happened? Moses comes in there with Moses and Aaron and God tells Moses and Aaron, destroy Egypt. And it took a whole year for God to rain down plagues of judgments on them. And those plagues of judgments correspond to our seven trumpet judgments and our vile judgments. We'll see that when we get more into detail with them. Why? They were warnings. What did God tell Moses to tell Pharaoh? Let my people go. 
and Pharaoh wouldn't. His heart hardened very much like in the book of Revelation. And for all this, the people did not repent, even though God sent great plagues and great judgments on them. They would not repent. They could not repent and they did not repent. But what was God doing? He was bringing his people out. So under point number one, the redemptive restraint observed is the consequence of the preaching of the gospel of God that he uses to restrain evil in the world. I'll, I'll give you a couple other verses because I want you to see it. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse three through seven. You've seen this one. This one here comes closer to home because it deals with the idea of the enemy making his way even into the temple, not the temple in Jerusalem, but the temple of the church of the living God. The temple of the people of the living God. Listen to what Second Thessalonians 2 verse 2 says. Uh, verse 3. You can start at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come first a what? Falling away. We call that the apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now notice how he describes him in verse 4. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he's God. When the enemy has made his way into the temple, that is bad news for the church. But notice even when he's there, what Paul teaches us is that there's a restraint keeping him from fully taking over the church. Look at the next verse. In verse five. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. Look at verse six. And now you know what is what? Withholding him. That's our word restraint. Stay with me now, saints. Here it is. The enemy will only make as much advancement in this world and control it and dominate it and take it over as God allows him. God restrains the wicked. He restrains the kings. He restrains the nations. He holds back the four winds of his judgments. He controls Satan. He restrains him. And how is he restraining him? And how has he restrained him? This question has been raised for decades. What is God's restraint system in this world? I want you to hear me now. God's restraint system, first and foremost, is his own sovereign decree. In other words, you can only go so far and you can't go any further. It's very much like the waves of the sea. He restrains the waves of the sea so that they run up to the seashore, but they don't go into land to destroy anyone. So God restrains the mystical spiritual powers and cosmic rulers of this world. He restrains kings. He restrains nations. He restrains men. He restrains Satan. Remember how he restrained the king of Gerar in the days of Abraham, Genesis 20, the Philistine king who was about to go into Sarah? In Genesis 3, remember, Noah, uh, Abraham had said to Sarah, tell them that you are my sister, not knowing that what Abraham was dealing with was kingdoms. And the kingdom of the Philistine, being part of the kingdom of Egypt, was about to go into Sarah. And you guys remember what God said in Genesis 25? God said to him, I know that you did it out of the integrity of your heart, that you didn't go into Sarah because I kept you back. I restrained you. Listen carefully to me, child of God. Restraint is a glorious attribute of God to keep everybody back from being as evil and wicked as they could. Unsaved man can't touch God's people. Unsaved kingdoms can't ruin God's purpose. Satan and his malevolent evil schemes and purposes can't thwart or stop God's plan. Nothing will stop God from accomplishing his purposes. And God will see to it that you and I do what he wants us to do while he restrains this world through this very means of, watch this now, the preaching of the gospel. We go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and notice what it says, uh, chapter 2 and verse 6. And we know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now is holding him back will hold him back until he is what? Taken out of the way. The grammar there is employing that there is a mystery power controlling the mystery power of Satan. There's a mystery power controlling the mystery power of Satan. There is a sovereign power on God's part holding back the powers of Satan while the gospel is being preached 
so that God's people can be sealed. One of the reasons why you and I want to be part of the plan of the preaching of the gospel is because it's through the preaching of the gospel that God's people are sealed. I'm going to give you one more verse to help you get this. This one is vivid. Remember we learned that John is a Neo-Daniel, Ezekiel, Zacharian prophet, is he not? The language we're dealing with in Revelation chapter 7 is also vividly in Daniel chapter 9. Go to Daniel chapter 9 and watch these five verses. You've heard this before if you've been taught by me. Uh, this is not Daniel chapter 9, it's Ezekiel chapter 9. You've heard these before if you've been taught by me. And it's important for you to grasp this language because when you see these kinds of major similarities, you can't ignore them. And I don't know why theologians would want to ignore the book of Daniel, the book of Zechariah, the book of Ezekiel, when it comes to the very same imagery that's in the book of Revelation. Listen to what it says in Revelation, Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. And watch how graphic this is. And I want you to think about God's restraining hand through the gospel in order that his people might be sealed even in times of great tribulation. And then maybe you will say to yourself, thank you, Lord. Watch this. He cried also in my ear with a loud voice saying, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. So here we have that apocalyptic image, don't we? Imagery, don't we? Of a, a, a group of men, actually angels, that are coming to destroy like the trumpet judgments, like the bold judgments like the wrath of the Lamb of God coming down upon the kings of the earth. Notice what it says. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, the temple, from which, uh, from which lieth toward the north, and every man a uh, slaughter weapon in his hand. We don't quite know what that weapon is, but, he's, but for Ezekiel, it was ominous. Every man had a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. Where are we at? In the temple. What's happening in the temple? God's, what we call warrior angels, are about to destroy. See, the same language is given to us in Revelation chapter 6, in Revelation 8 and 9, Revelation 15 and 16. You see the similarity, saints? Stay with me, we got a few more minutes. Now notice that the wrath is about to come down, very much like in Revelation chapter 6, right? Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb of God, for the great day of his wrath has come. And yet in chapter 7, what do we have? Restraint. And sealing is taking place. Watch what happens here. It tells us in verse 3, And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house and he called to the man clothed with linen which had the writer's inkhorn by his side now the man with the writer's inkhorn by his side is about to do what mark out those who will be protected from the judgment watch this now so you just let it carry through don't flag me just let me carry it through so watch this it says over in verse 3 Verse four, and the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem and do what? Set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations done in Israel. So do you see the same imagery? In Revelation 14, they had a mark on their what? Forehead. In Revelation chapter seven, what? They're all sealed. Here is the same idea of sealing, meaning owning, meaning authenticating, meaning affirming, meaning protecting, meaning claiming as your own. Now look at this again. Look at this as amazing and ominous and worthy of our heart's meditation. The Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all of the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. Now I want you to mark. They have just went through and done what? Marked them out. The men with the destroying weapons are ready to go. What did they have to do? They had to wait. They were restrained while the mark was taking place. Now look at the next verse, verse five. 
And to the others, he said in my hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. Here it is now. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. Do you see it? They're sealed. Do not come upon them. And begin at my sanctuary. Where is that? The church. Then they began at the ancient men. Who are that? The rulers of the church, which were before the house. And he said unto me, defile the house. What house? God's church. Why? Because it was already defiled. And filled the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. This is Jerusalem. This is where the temple is. Now listen to what Isaiah says, I mean, Ezekiel says, and it came to pass while they were slaying them and I was left that I fell upon my face and cried and said, ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the residue of Israel and the pouring out of your fury on Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. And the land is full of blood and the city full of perverseness for they say the Lord has forsaken the earth and the Lord does not see. And as for me also, my uh, mine eyes shall not spare, says the Lord, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with the linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, watch this now, I have done as you have commanded. I want you to get this. The writer inkhorn man was the one going around putting the mark on the foreheads of all those who would be sealed from the judgment. And when he finished his sealing, The judgment went forth. And what we're talking about in our text in Revelation chapter 4, 7 verse 4, is that God seals his own while restraining the judgments that he's going to pour upon the world. And when he has sealed the last of his own, then there will be no reason why God will have to hold back his judgments. So what we're going to do next time, tomorrow, is going to pick up right at Revelation chapter chapter 7, verse 4, and begin to deal with the terminology of the 12 tribes. And then we're going to deal with the terminology of, as your outline says, hearing and then seeing. And then we're going to tie the three categories together, Revelation 7, 14, and 21, to understand a glorious truth, that if you are sealed, you are saved. And if you are saved, you are sealed. And there's no one that is unsaved that is sealed and there there's no one that is unsealed that is saved in other words as we learned in revelation chapter 9 verse 4 that the judgments that came out in the trumpet judgments came upon all those who were not sealed so what you and i want to ask the question again as we close is are we sealed so tomorrow we will take this up more We're going to take a break for a few minutes and then we're going to come back for our prayer time. If you want to, you can email us at gbchayward at gmail.com, gbchayward at gmail.com. We'll take your prayer request. We'll be doing that for about 20, 25 minutes until about eight o'clock. We're glad to do it. We know where we are in our time. We know what we're dealing with in terms of the difficulties of our world. And we're looking forward to praying with you. We'll be right back.